let's go ahead and begin. I will very quickly tell you what uh, is in the comments. The interlinear tools for chapters 8 and 9 of the Gospel of Luke are there. Um, I think we'll get into chapter 9 tonight. And then the synoptic parallels. So um, that way you can compare the accounts of the various gospel writers. Hi there, Diane. And you're welcome, Edith. And hi, Linda. So I'm glad uh, all of you folks are on board. So let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we uh, give you thanks and praise for who you are and for your blessings uh, to our families, to our congregations, and to us personally. Most of all, we give you thanks for the gift of Jesus. Uh, in him, we have life with you. We have the forgiveness of our sins. And Father, we pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, we would learn to love you better tonight, and also that you would empower us by your Spirit to share the good news of Jesus with all the world. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. And Linda, like we did last night, if you want to just give me kind of an update, uh, any update you might have on Brian, I can uh, share that or we can share that and, and we'll be sure to include Brian in our prayers before we finish this evening. So we're in the middle of chapter 8, actually toward the end of it, I guess, and we are at verse 40. Um, I guess to, to kind of set the table, you know, we, we've seen that um, at least the kernel of the gospel has been planted among the Gentiles, and now uh, Jesus is headed back to his own people. And um, that becomes important as we come into chapter 9 now. So verse 40 of chapter 8. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue, and falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age. Now, you remember that in the Gospel of Luke, we have usually incidents that involve a man and then a woman, etc., etc. That's the way Luke operates. He mentions women more specifically than the other Gospels do. And, um, and really, uh, as we saw in that one section that we looked at in um, chapter 8, um, excuse me, not chapter 8, ch yeah, chapter 8 at the beginning, verses 1 to 3, where it specifically mentioned uh, women, uh, Luke puts more of an emphasis on women as disciples as witnesses and so forth. I mean, you see them in other Gospels, but that's really an emphasis of Luke. And we've looked at various examples of how you have a man, then you have a woman, affirming the same kinds of things or experiencing the same kind of things. So now what we're going to have here is Jesus being called upon to heal the only daughter of a man named Jairus. And you'll remember that back in uh, verse 42, excuse, or I'm not, back in chapter 7, verses 11 to 17, um, I'm referencing verse 42, there was an only, uh, a widow with an only son who was um, uh, observed by Jesus. And Jesus had compassion on her. He was already dead and he raised uh, him from the dead. So we have these offsetting or doubly uh, confirming incidents once again. Back then in chapter 7 verses 11 to 17, it was the dead only son of a widow. And here we have the only daughter of a ruler of the synagogue um, who is dying. 
Now, I want you to notice in verse 40, once again, the use of the word crowd. The crowd welcomes Jesus. Once more, with very rare exceptions, throughout the Gospel of Luke, uh, when he uses crowd, he's just using people, uh, using a term for people who are only interested in what they can get out of Jesus or are curiosity seekers. They're not the people. The people are those who believe in Jesus. Jews or Gentiles, they're the people because they become the people of God. Uh, take a look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. This is a, a touchstone passage for Lutherans uh, because it's, it's one that it really highly informs our notion of the priesthood of all believers. Uh, Peter speaks to the people of Asia Minor, the Christians in Asia Minor here. He says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of, uh, for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. And that's really important. We are made God's people through Jesus Christ. The Word comes to us and the, the Holy Spirit uses the Word, creates faith within us, and we become part of the people of God. We're no longer just faces in the crowd. We are people with a name, called by name, by Jesus Christ, and claimed in our holy baptism as children of God, huh? where God reaches out and makes us his own. So here is the crowd, the people who do not yet believe in Jesus. When he comes back into his homeland, this crowd comes around him. Curiosity seekers, people wanting uh, healing, people wanting uh, exorcism and so forth. And among them is this man named Jairus. And it says that he is a ruler of the synagogue. The word, oh, I think I, I need to double check that, that. I think the word there is epistates. Let me look that up in the original Greek. I have the interlinear here. And I'll scroll down to our verse. I meant to double check this for, uh, word and didn't. Okay, because let's uh, verse forty one maybe. Let's see. Behold, came a man whose name was Jairus. Oh no, it says he's a ruler. Okay, uh, the the word that's used there is archon, um, and we get words like archaeology. Uh, from this word, because the prefix of it, uh, or the root of it, arkos, is, uh, is like arche, uh, means old. And so it's used for a ruler or a chief, a leading person. And generally speaking, this was associated with people who were older, but obviously he had a 12-year-old daughter. Um, that's not saying much, because as we know, men married later in life. The women married young to extend their child-bearing uh, possibilities, but the men married uh, older. At any rate, he's a ruler of the Jews. And what did the ruler of the Jews uh, do? Well, he, he was not a rabbi formally. He was a layperson who kind of had charge of the local synagogue. Probably the local synagogue was very small, and um, so anyway, he was kind of the ruler over the synagogue and he falls at Jesus' feet, which is, it can be an act of worship, but it also can be just an act of utter submission. This man is at the end of his tether. And it's very interesting. It specifically mentions that the daughter is 12 years of age, The number 12 comes up a lot, not just in this section, but throughout the gospel. Remember, Jesus was 12 
when we have the incident of the family going to Jerusalem and, and him staying behind and talking with the teachers. Um, I don't think we should read too much into this. I spent a lot of time uh, two days ago kind of refreshing myself with what the commentaries had to say about this. And basically all the commentators go, we don't think that there's anything deep about this, uh, that she was 12 years of age. And then the woman we're going to meet in just a moment was... Um, um, had a discharge of blood for 12 years. It's just um, what the gospel writers do on occasion. They get really specific about things. And, you know, the more specific a description is of an incident or a person, the more vivid it is. So imagine this man, Jairus' desperation, laying aside all pride, um, though he's a Jewish leader, and bowing down at the feet of this itinerant uh, preacher who is beginning to elicit opposition from even the scribes and the Pharisees in Jerusalem. So he's really desperate um, for the healing of his daughter. All right, we're in the middle of verse 42. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had, a, who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. I want to stop right there. If you look at the parallel accounts, Matthew gives this sort of internal uh, conversation the woman has where she says, I believe that if I just touch his garment, because I know who he is, I know his power and his authority, if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. Luke doesn't include that. Verse 45, and Jesus says, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. Like, everybody's touching you, basically. What do you mean, who touched me? Verse 46, but Jesus said, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been healed, uh, immediately healed. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well go in peace. Now, what we have here is, is, and this appears in all of the parallel um, tellings of this, this, this inter interchanged or interlaced set of miracles, right? Jairus is there. He's on the scene. He wants Jesus, um, he wants to implore Jesus to come and heal his daughter. But in the meantime, someone comes along and touches Jesus' the hem of his garment, and it's because of her faith in Jesus' capacity to do this that this woman is healed. <coughs> um, but in the meantime, look what's, what happens. And, and I think what we're meant to think, if this was the very first time you read this, okay, what you would be meant to think is, this woman with this discharge got in the way of saving uh, the daughter of Jairus, uh, saving her life. And so it's, it's like, oh man, uh, it's too late. But the point here is that the God could, who can heal a discharge that has gone on for 12 years can also bring the dead back to life. It's not late. It's not too late. All right, verse 49. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. But Jesus, on hearing them, hearing him, excuse me, but Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear. Only believe, and she will be well. 
And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James. Uh, if you're the type to underline or highlight in your Bible, I would underline or highlight Peter, John, and James. And I would do it for several reasons. Number one, remember the, the principle on which Jesus operates in making disciples. He spends the least amount of time with the crowds in preaching and usually only in parables to entice or whet their interest and doing healing and so forth. Then he spends a, a, the next bigger amount of time with the 12. But he spends the most amount of time with the three, Peter, James, and John. And so Jesus invites them to be with him frequently. We'll see it in the garden. We're going to see it later here in chapter 9 at the Mount of Transfiguration. Why? Number one, as I've mentioned before, it's easier to interact with and impact three people than it is crowds and crowds of people. Impact a few people and you create a ripple effect. This is why we are emphasizing in the NALC and at Living Water the importance of small discipleship groups. Two, three, four people gathered around the Word of God. So that's the number one reason to mention it, but also because of what's going to come later in Luke 9 at the Transfiguration. So he takes Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the child with him. Verse 52. And all were weeping and mourning for her. And remember, among them would have been the professional weepers. There were professional mourners. That's what they did. They would come when they learned of a death, and they would weep and wail because they didn't want to have anyone uh, be in a situation where there wasn't someone um, mourning for a person who's passed away. And all were weeping and mourning for her, but he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. This is really interesting, this juxtaposition of weeping and laughing. Um, it, the weeping, uh, some of it is inauthentic, obviously, if you can so quickly move to laugh, laughing. And um, it's a laughter of cynicism. You know, she's dead. It's over. Verse 54. But taking her by the hand, he called, her, he called saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned. And she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given her to eat. And her parents were amazed. But he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Oh, they must be back in Jewish territory, right? <laughs> back when he cast the, the demons into the pigs, he told the man who was a Gentile to go tell the people in his town, which was part of the Decapolis, part of the Gentile territory, go and tell them what God has done for you. He says, shh, don't tell anyone yet. Is It isn't that Jesus doesn't want them eventually to tell. It's that, again, until his mission is accomplished, the Jews would misunderstand what these signs meant, except for a very few. Um, so he says, not until all has been fulfilled and until Jesus dies on the cross and he rises from the dead, not all has been fulfilled. Now, I want to call attention here in verse 55. It says, and her spirit returned. Now, that's an okay translation. There's nothing wrong with it. I could defend it. The word that's used there is pneuma. But remember that the word pneuma can also mean breath. I'm saying this because I don't want anyone to have uh, uh, fall into the false and unbiblical idea that our spirit is some kind of ghost-like um, thing. 
when we are raised from the dead, we will be raised bodily. Huh? And so it isn't like, um, you know, Casper the friendly ghost left the body uh, of this little girl. Hmm? Um, this, I think, references more breath. Take a look at Luke 23, verse 46. Luke 23, verse 46. It says, Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Remember the word pneuma can be mean breath, spirit, or wind. And I think what happened is life came back into the little girl. Just as Jesus exhaled his life, he breathed his last before he was raised again. But that's another story. So I think you can translate that passage as, as breath or as spirit. But I like breath, the idea of translating it as breath even better. Um, that her, her breath returned to her and she got up at once. It's a miracle, right? It's a, it, she's physically breathing again. She's living again and she's healed. Now, with this um, sign, um, raising this little girl from the dead, the way he raised the son of the widow from the dead. You have the, the, this absolute confirmation of Jesus' power over death. And in the midst of it, right in the middle of it, just, just as a, a product of faith, um, this woman who had this discharge was healed. All right, so now let's, let's forge ahead into Luke chapter 9, verse 1. I want to make sure I'm not losing. Okay, I have to check comment section every once in a while because sometimes it scrolls up and I don't see things. If you have any comments or questions or thoughts, just throw them at me. Chapter 9. And Jesus called the twelve together and gave them, look at the words. We've seen these words paired together before. Power and authority. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. Now, if you look at the interlinear, just take a look at the interlinear and at Luke 9. And it says, having called together then the twelve, he gave them power, there's dunamis, and exousian, authority. Now, if you check dunamis, you can see there's some overlapping of the meaning of the words, but it's, uh, dunamis is usually associated with physical power, force, might, ability, efficacy, energy, um, and it can be wrought in uh, uh, physical, powerful deeds, um, power, might, strength, all right? Then if you take a look at exousia, which is translated as authority, Again, there's some overlap, but it's the power to act and moral authority and influence, all right? One is uh, intrinsic, more intrinsic. The other is um, um, uh, conferred. And so the idea here is that Jesus is giving to his church and this is the idea that we'll see in Matthew 28 also. Jesus is giving to his church the authority and the power to do exactly what he did. To declare the forgiveness of sins through the gospel. To declare, we're talking about the office of the keys. To withhold uh, the declaration of the forgiveness of sins for the unrepentant. To share the body and blood of the Lord to share the, the Holy Spirit through uh, baptism, Jesus is conferring on his church 
and making it intrinsic to the life of the church, uh, the very thing that he said, uh, that the very things that he did. Remember, he said in the Gospel of John, you will do things greater than these because he ascends into the heaven uh, into heaven and sends his Holy Spirit. And what did I mean just a moment ago when I mentioned Matthew 28? Turn to it real quickly. Matthew 28. At the very end of it, the Great Commission. But it's interesting how Jesus puts that. Matthew uh, 28, um, at, at verse 18, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. What's he saying? He is saying, you are going in my authority, and I have authority over heaven and earth. Now, Jesus could have gotten, remember, that authority on the cheap had he caved in to the devil in the wilderness. But instead, Jesus took control and authority and power over heaven and earth through his death and resurrection. And now Jesus says, we don't need to worry about the devil uh, and he says that, you know, th that the devil itself will not be able to overcome his true church. Huh? That's not possible. So Jesus has all authority and power and he confers it on the church. Okay, Anne asks, why did Jesus not want the girl's parents to tell? I thought, now, no, what, what I meant uh, in the incident from last night was that that was among the Gentiles, Anne. But he's back in Jewish territory. So that's why he's saying uh, that, that they're not allowed to tell. Apparently, Jesus trusted the Gentiles to not muff this up uh, the way he felt that the Jews would. And he was certain that the Jews would not understand who he was until after his resurrection. But uh, he, he did entrust this Gentile who had been relieved of the legion of demons to go back into his community and, and preach and teach. Uh, so apparently Jesus was allowing that to happen in the Gentile community. And remember last night I said the same thing happened uh, with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman at the well at Sychar. Jesus let her go in and tell, this. The, I think this is the Messiah, right? Um, it was as though, um, what does it say? Uh, uh, Gentiles seek wisdom and, and Jews look for signs. And Jesus is saying, the problem with my fellow Jews is that they confuse the signs with being the ultimate point of it. That's why the crowds are chasing him around. They want what they can get out of Jesus but they are not paying attention to what these miraculous signs point to, that he is the Savior, that he has power over sin, death, and darkness. So that's what's going on, Ian. I'm glad you asked that question because I, I probably didn't make it clear enough last night. So now Jesus sends the 12 out to say that the kingdom of God is near, repent, um, and to heal, etc., etc., to replicate his ministry. Then in verse 3, chapter 9, And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. Now, you remember last night I referenced this passage. Just slip back and look at uh, Luke 8, verse 37. Right after uh, Jesus um, exercised the legion of demons from the man and they went into the pigs and the pigs went over the the cliff into the sea verse 37 then all the people of the surrounding country of the garrisons asked him to depart from them for they were seized with great fear so he got into the boat and returned 
And I mentioned that Jesus won't go where he's not welcome. Here, the people specifically asked Jesus to leave, so he left. Here, what Jesus is telling the 12 as he's sending them out is, if they won't receive you, shake the dust off your feet as basically a testimony against them. They weren't willing to receive the Lord's sent ones. Remember, the term apostle means sent one. Jesus had sent them, and they weren't willing to receive him. And he says, just shake the dust off your feet and leave. When we get rebuffed for sharing or trying to share the hope that we have in Christ with others, it's not a time to get angry. We just shake the dust off our feet and move on. And we trust that we've done what we can to plant the seed in that spot. Someone else may come along and be able to plant the seed more firmly. But maybe we were just sent to prepare the, the, the soil. Who knows? But our job is done, right? And we shouldn't harbor guilt or shame about that. We just shake the dust off our feet and move on. And it says in verse 6, And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. You know, sometimes we come up with questions. We wonder, uh, what was it you asked Deb last night? Oh, what happened to the demons after, after the pigs went into the sea? And Luke doesn't tell us, and we don't know. And, you know, the, the gospel writers just tell us what they deem necessary for us to believe in Jesus. Well, one of the questions I wonder about, and it's not important, but I wonder, what was Jesus doing while the twelve were out on this mission? Was he by himself? What, what was going on? Um, we don't know, but it's kind of, it's, it's a mystery, and it's just left there. We have no idea. Now, uh, we have this shift. Um, this reads very much like a novel. There are different scenes going on now. Jesus sends the, the apostles out. We don't know what's going on with Jesus. The apostles are doing this their thing. And then, verse 7, apparently what is going on with um, uh, Jesus has come to his attention. Now, this Herod is Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great. Uh, by the way, I just want to mention, because this is going to become a, a really important theme when we get into the Transfiguration. Um, when we're told in verse 6 that the disciples departed and went through the villages preaching the gospel and healing everywhere, you know, they may have wanted to just stay with Jesus. Um, and the note I, I wrote to myself is, we cannot stay in our holy huddles all the time. The, the point of being gathered for worship is not to just be there and feel, golly, I'm part of this exclusive, wonderful group, and these are all a bunch of nice people, and no one ever says a bad or discouraging word to me, and everything's wonderful here. That's not the point. The point is to be gathered into the presence of God, to hear his word, to receive his word in the sacrament, and thus empowered to move out into the world with the good news of Jesus. Right? This is why the holiest moment of worship is when we're told, go in peace, serve the Lord, and the people of God move out into the world, into their daily lives, among their families, their places of work, and so forth. They've been empowered by the Word of God to move out into the world. And, uh, you know, once we get into the account of the Transfiguration, Peter's going to want to build three booths. He's, he's, he wants to capture this moment, and he doesn't want to leave the mountain. There he is in the presence of this, this amazing thing, and he knows now that the, this numinous awe that he feels, though he felt fear at first, is not going to kill him. So he just wants to hold on to this. He, he doesn't want to let go of this. And what it, it is a fundamental principle of Christian faith that you cannot remain faithful 
if you just try to hold on to it and capture it. You must give it away or it won't grow. Christian faith must be used. It must be given away. And we'll talk more about that. But a great example of this is the people in the wilderness, the, the Exodus people of God in the wilderness when God gave them manna and he said, look, only gather for six days of the week because on the sixth day, I'll give you enough to eat on the seventh day. And of course, some people tried to gather on the seventh day and it all rotted, right? The point is, if we try to hoard the word of God, the blessings of God, the gospel, and not share it, it will die within us. The gospel needs to be shared. Faith needs to be shared. When it is not shared, it becomes our private party. And we think it's just Jesus and me or Jesus and this little group of people. And it's not. A little group of people could be a megachurch. All right. But the point is that the gospel is meant to be taken out into the world. Right? It's not to be hoarded. Who puts, who lights a candle, right? Uh, or a lamp and puts a basket over it. That's what Jesus says. No, what you do instead is you take the basket off so it provides light to the whole house. Well, our call is to provide light to the whole world by sharing the gospel. And as we share the gospel and as we reconnect with Jesus, right, then our faith grows. Faith grows through sharing. It does. Look at, again, the woman at the well. She becomes more certain of who Jesus is as she shares Jesus. Or um, uh, consider in John's gospel, the man whose sight is restored to him. In John, isn't that nine or maybe five? One of those two chapters. It's either five or nine. The, the blind man has his sight restored to him and he gets pushback. And the more pushback he gets, the more certain he becomes of who Jesus is. He thought he was just a nice man. And as he's being challenged, he begins to see he must be a prophet. He must be, he must be the Messiah. He must be God in the flesh. There's this development that as he pushes out to share the simple truth about Jesus, his faith takes hold and grows. Faith grows through the sharing of it. In, in part, that's one of the contributing factors that allows faith to grow. So Jesus is saying, don't stay in this holy huddle. Right? We, I need to send you out. Now, what's going to happen, another aspect of Jesus' teaching and discipling is they're going to come back and he's basically going to debrief. Right? So the, the principle is, Watch me do this. Now you go do this. When you come back, we'll debrief about you doing this. Then I'm going to send you back out again. Right? And just think of worship and Bible study as regular debriefing. Right? You've been out into the world. You come back into God's presence. You worship and praise him. You hear his word. You receive the sacrament. He sends you out into the world. You come back in to be debriefed. Right? That's how Jesus uh, disciples. And the same thing with small groups. That's how small groups work. You gather around the word. You pray for each other. You move into the world. You share your faith. You run into opposition. You run into affirmation. You come back. You share it together. You're around the word. You pray about it. You see how it all works? And so Jesus is sending them out. Now, I'm not even going to, uh, since it's 943, I'm not going to start with uh, verse 7 then. And we'll move on to um, uh, Herod and then the feeding of the 5,000 in Luke's telling of it. And... Um, Luke chapter 9 is the turning point of the gospel. Once we get to Luke 9.51, the die is cast. 
and Jesus is moving to Jerusalem. Wow, 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 yay! Linda says that Brian was moved out of ICU today. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so that's progress. We can be thankful to God for that, and we'll pray for his continued recovery, and we'll pray for healing. Well, let's do pray right now. Gracious God, we place our lives in your strong hands, and we thank you that Brian is out of the surgical ICU now and that he is um, uh, making some more progress. We pray for continued healing for him. We pray um, again for guidance and wisdom for those who care for him, and we pray also, uh, Lord, for an end to the pandemic. We know that there are a lot of dangers ahead of us right now because of the uh, 3,000 variant mutant versions of this that are now uh, abroad. Uh, we pray that in this race between the vaccine and these uh, mutant generations of the virus, that you will give the victory to the vaccine that you have um, we thank you that you have caused this vaccine to be developed, and we pray that uh, this thing will get distributed and administered in a timely way. Father, we give you thanks and praise that we can call upon you in every time of need, that you care about us and what happens in our lives. Lord, we pray your continuing comfort for the Wingo family and for the Grabman family in the wake of their recent losses. We pray for healing for all who are in hospitals or nursing care facilities, God, and we pray that people would see in their healing your hand, your work. Lord, guide those in the medical profession that they would be guided by you. Father, as our congregations worship this weekend, grant that we will truly worship, honor, and praise you, and that empowered by your word and the sacraments we receive, we will be sent into the world with the good news of Jesus, and we can go confidently and boldly and humbly sharing Jesus with others. Send workers into the harvest, Father. Transform this nation and this world as people turn to Christ. And we pray all of these things in his name. Amen. Thanks, everyone. By the grace of God, I'll plan on seeing you here at 9 o'clock on Monday night as we continue in chapter 9 of Luke's Gospel. Uh, Living Water folks, watch for Sunday worship to drop sometime tomorrow, uh, later in the day. And then, of course, we'll have Holy Communion at 11 a.m. on the YouTube channel. Just prepare your bread and wine in advance. Linda, that's uh, the, the, I've had two great pieces of news today, and I appreciate you sharing it with me. God bless all of you. Bye now.